A well-known writer has said of man in this advanced stage, If we are willing to believe in this mastery over the body, we must be prepared to believe in the mastery over our own inner thoughts and feelings. That a man should be a prey to any thought that chances to take possession of his mind is commonly among us assumed as unavoidable. It may be a matter of regret that he should be kept awake at night from anxiety as to the issue of a lawsuit on the morrow, but that he should have the power of determining whether he should be kept awake or not seems an extravagant demand. The image of an impending calamity is no less odious, but its very odiousness, we say, makes it haunt the mind all the more pertinaciously and it is useless to expel it. Yet this is an absurd notion for man, the heir of all the ages, hag-ridden by the flimsy creatures of his own brain. If a pedal in our boots torments us, we expel it. We take off the boot and shake it out. And once the matter is fairly understood, it is just as easy to expel an intruding and obnoxious thought from the mind. About this there ought to be no mistake, no two opinions. The thing is obvious, clear, and unmistakable. It should be as easy to expel an obnoxious thought from the mind as it is to shake a stone out of your shoe. And till a man can do that, it is just nonsense to talk about his ascendancy over nature and all the rest of it. He is a mere slave and prey to the bat-winged phantoms that flit through the corridors of his own brain. Yet the weary and careworn faces that we, we meet by thousands, even among the affluent classes of civilization, testify only too clearly how seldom this mastery is obtained, how rare indeed to meet a man, how common, rather, to discover a creature hounded on by tyrant thoughts or cares or desires, cowering, wincing under the lash, or perchance priding himself to run merrily in obedience to a driver that rattles the reins and persuades him that he is free, whom we cannot converse with in a careless tete-a-tete -tete because this alien presence is always there on the watch. It is one of the most promising doctrines of certain schools of occult philosophy that the power of expelling thoughts, or if need be, killing them dead on the spot, must be obtained. Naturally, the art requires practice, but uh, like other arts, when once acquired there is no mystery or difficulty about it, and it is worth practice. It may indeed fairly be said that life only begins when this art has been acquired, for obviously when, instead of being ruled by individual thoughts, the whole flock of them in their immense multitude and variety and capacity is ours to direct and dispatch and employ where we, where we list. Life becomes a thing so vast and grand compared with what it was before that its former condition may well appear almost antenatal. If you can kill a thought dead for the time being, you can do anything with it that you please, and therefore it is that this power is so valuable. And it not only frees a man from mental torment, which is nine-tenths at least of the torments of life, but it gives to him a concentrated power of hand handling mental work absolutely unknown to him before. The two things are correlative to each other. While at work, your thought is to be actually concentrated in it, undistracted by anything whatsoever irrelevant, to the matter at hand, pounding away like a great engine with giant power and perfect economy, no wear and tear or friction or dislocation of parts owing to the working of different forces at the same time. Then when the work is finished, if there is no more occasion for the use of the machine, it must stop equally, absolutely stop entirely. No worrying, as if a parcel of boys were allowed to play their devilments with a locomotive as soon as it was in the shed. And the man must retire into that region of his consciousness where his true self dwells, 
I say that the power of the thought machine itself is enormously increased by this faculty of letting it alone on the one hand and of using it singly and with concentration on the other. It becomes a true tool which a master workman lays down when done with, but which only a bungler carries about with him all the time to show that he is the possessor of it. If the student will master the ideal expressed in the above several quoted paragraphs, he will indeed become a master of mind. And if he will extend the ideal to the field of emotion of his emotions and will put into practice there the same ideal and method, he will also become a master of his emotions, an accomplishment of inestimable value. But before doing either of these things, he will find it necessary to come to a full realization of the fact that his self, his real I, is a something superior to and transcending both his thought and his emotions. He must enter into a vivid realization of the I am before he may hope to be able to say I do regarding these accomplishments. As the old Rosicrucian masters were wont to say, when the I knows itself to be the self and master, then only is it able to take its throne and enforce its will upon its subjects in the world of its thoughts, desires, feelings, and emotions. Not only may the enlightened I manifest its power along the lines above indicated, but it may also work its will in that region, which popular modern psychology has chosen to call the subconscious mind. The latter is merely that great region of mind outside of the limits of the concentrated field of attention. In the, that great region, a great part of the thinking of the average man is performed, the results being flashed into the field of his attention in a more or less haphazard way. Without going deeper into the subject, we would say here that the man who has grasped the reality and power of the I is able to issue positive commands to this part of his mental machinery and not only cause it to, perfor to perform the work of thought classification, induction and deduction for him, but also to present the report of such work to his conscious attention at any specified time and place. The master of mind relieves themselves of much of the drudgery of ordinary intellectual processes in this way and obtain results logically perfect and ready for use according to the measure of training and direction which they have been able to impose upon the aforesaid regions of, of their mind. In conclusion, it should be called to the attention of the student that the average man, conscious only on some of the lower subplanes and subdivisions of the plane of human consciousness, and that there are wonderful regions within that great plane awaiting the exploration of the wise of the, of the race and generations of the distant future. The wise of the race are not waiting for the centuries long slow evolution of the bulk of the race, but are taking the shortcut to the higher subplanes by means of careful training along the lines indicated by capable teachers who have demonstrated the virtue and value of the methods which have been known to and taught by the advanced occultists for thousands of years. The Rosicrucian teachings being splendid examples of such achievements. Even without calling upon the two still higher planes of consciousness, the enlightened race may reach heights of mental achievement which are so far above those dreamed of by the average person of the race as to appear like the wildest fiction. The Plane of the Consciousness of the Demigods There is a plane of consciousness so much higher than even the plane of human consciousness or even the highest subplanes of that great plane that the Rosicrucians have applied to it the somewhat fanciful term of the plane of consciousness of the demigods. This because the individual who attains these heights and is able to conscious on this plane, to be conscious on this plane, is so much bigger, higher than mere man, that he seems to be almost as the, as the gods. 
The Rosicrucians teach that on this high plane of being dwell certain very advanced souls, once men, but now almost as gods when compared to men, who aid in the great work of the advancement of the race of man in the general course of spiritual evolution. The teaching is that the race as a whole is slowly evolving on to the said higher plane of consciousness, and long ages from now will consciousness will conscious normally on it. In the meantime, however, certain advanced souls have transcended the human plane and have passed on to the higher plane where they aid and assist the rest of the race. Moreover, to the individual whose unfoldment is rapid from one or more of many well-known causes, there comes at times flashes of consciousness from the higher plane aforesaid which at least for the time being bring the individual into conscious contact with that plane. The pages of the mystics' records are filled with statements of experiences of this kind. In certain forms of poetic fervor, religious exaltation, and mystic experience, these flashes come and are then recorded by the individual experiencing them, the record, however, usually being given in the terms of the philosophy, religion, or general belief of the person experiencing the contact or illumination, the person not fully realizing from just what source the flash of truth has come. In recent years, many of these experiences have been classified and included in works of writers under the general name of cosmic consciousness. In most cases, the persons have attained These experiences and those who have recorded them are of the opinion that the flash of of consciousness realized is the highest possible. But as wonderful as are these experiences, they are in most cases but flashes of insight of the light of some of the lower subplanes of the great plane of the demigods. Countless higher planes being existent and waiting the unfoldment of being, to experience their light and glory. And beyond all of such there existing the highest plane of all, the plane of the gods, to which all the rest is but a faint shadow of the reality. The characteristic feature of the plane of consciousness of the demigods is that of oneness with universal life, the consciousness of the life of all manifestation. Varying in many degrees and forms, of course, this is the characteristic feature of all experiences of this great plane of conscious activity. On this plane, the individual feels in close touch with all the rest of creation, a united part of, not apart from, the all. The experience of even a slight momentary contact with this plane of being constitutes the common mystic experience of which sages, seers, poets, and illumined souls of all ages have sung and and regarding which they have tried to inform us in the words inadequate to the task. The study of these mystics reports, though, much light on the subject and is well worth the time and attention of all true students of the Rosicrucian teaching. But the student must always remember that these experiences are not the end of all thought on the subject, nor the final word of truth. As valuable as it is, as is this part of his teaching, it must never be mistaken for the highest peak of the mountain of truth. To those who have, who have explored the flashes of illumination or the glimpse of the fire of cosmic consciousness, both of which classes of phenomena belong to the plane of the consciousness of the demigods, there has come a realization of the actual oneness of life in the universe and an actual awareness that the universe is animated by one life which is diffused among and permeates every portion of its extent and manifestation. To such has come an assurance that there is nothing dead in the universe, that every part and portion, individual and collective, is instinct with life. Not only this, but for at least the time of the experience, there has come a sense of absolute certainty that the individual is in touch with this one life and is an actual center of activity within its presence. 
It should be pointed out, moreover, that in such experiences there is not merely the intellectual conviction of the certainty of the facts just stated, but that, on the contrary, there is manifested an actual knowing, direct and immediate, of such facts. The person having the experience knows these things just as he knows that he himself is alive and present in the universe. It is impossible to convey the exact nature of this consciousness to any who have not had at least a faint flash of it. It can be, des be described only in its own terms. In most of these cases, while the actual consciousness has passed away after a few moments, there has been left a memory which abides ever with the individual and which gives to him such a certainty of the truth of which he has been a witness that nothing can ever shake his convention thereof. It must be remembered that these flashes of consciousness are prophecies of the stage of consciousness which at some future time will become the normal state of consciousness of the race. Moreover, it must not be forgotten that there exist certain advanced souls on this earth to whom this stage or state of consciousness is the normal and habitual one and in whom there always exists a realization of actual consciousness of the at one with the universal life. Such beings are indeed demigods as compared to the average human being. Some of the great world leaders, the founders of great religions and others of their kind, were filled with this consciousness and strove to make it manifest in a veiled form to their followers who were not strong enough to bear the full truth. Many of these great souls are still present on the earth plane in the flesh, in newly incarnated forms, continuing their work and striving to uplift the race. A modern poet expressing the conviction of universal oneness of life uses terms which will be recognized by all who have had flashes of co cosmic consciousness as follows. For the all is one, and all are part, and not apart, as they seem to be. And the blood of life has a single heart beating through God and Claude and me. Walt Whitman, who himself had experienced cosmic consciousness, says of the experience, as in a swoon, one instant, another sun, inevitable, full dazzles me, and all the orbs I knew, and brighter and unknown orbs, one instant of the future land, heaven's land. I cannot be awake, for nothing looks to me as it did before, or else I am awake for the first time, and all before me has been a mean dream, I mean a mean sleep. When I try to tell the best, I find I cannot. My tongue is ineffectual on its pivots. My breath will not be obedient to its organs. I become a dumb man. Tennyson, according to his friends, had glimpses and flashes of cosmic consciousness, and in, and in many of his poems, he has given expression to the thoughts and feelings which had come to him at that time. The following is a good illustration of the latter. For knowledge is the swallow on the lake that sees and stirs the surface shadow there, but never yet hath dipped into the ab ab absum, the absum of all absoms beneath, within, the blue of sky and sea and the green of earth, and in a million millionth of a grain, which clef and clef again for evermore, and ever vanishing, never vanishes. And more, my son, for more than once when I sat all alone, Revolving in myself, that word which is a symbol of myself, the mortal symbol of self, was loosed and passed into the nameless as a cloud. Melts into heaven, I touched my limbs. The limbs were strange, not mine, and yet no shadow of doubt, but utter clearness, and through loss of self, the gain of such large life as matched with ours were sun to spark, unshadowable in words, themselves but shadows of a shadow world. Dr. Richard Maurice Buck of Toronto, Canada, a number of years ago, published a book entitled Cosmic Consciousness. 
in which he grouped together a number of very interesting experiences along these lines, which had been related by those experiencing them. Dr. Buck himself, as well as his friend, Walt Whitman, and several other close friends, had experienced flashes of this same stage of consciousness. He deduced the following general ideal from the consideration of these experiences. Superimposed upon self-consciousness, as is that faculty upon simple consciousness, a third and higher form of consciousness is at present making its appearance in our race. This higher form of consciousness, when it appears, occurs as it must, at the full maturity of the individual, at about the age of 35, but al almost always between the ages of 30 and 40. There have been occasional cases of it for the last 2,000 years, and it is becoming more and more common. In fact, in all appearances, as far as observed, it obeys the laws to which every nascent faculty is subject. Many more or less perfect examples of this new faculty exist in the world today. And it has been my privilege to know personally and have had the opportunity of studying several men and women who have possessed it. In the course of a few more millennia, there should be born from the present human race a higher type of man possessing this higher type of consciousness. This new race, as it Excuse me. This new race, as it may well be called, would occupy toward us a position such as that occupied by us toward the simple, conscious, elusus homo. The advent of this higher, better, and happier race would simply justify the long agony of its birth through countless ages of our past. And it is the first article of my belief some of the grounds for which I have endeavored to lay before you that a new race is in course of evolution. In another part of his book, Dr. Buck gives the following general characteristic of the special type of experiences recorded by him in the book. I have in the last three years collected 23 cases of this so-called cosmic consciousness. In each case, the onset or oncoming of the new faculty is always sudden, instantaneous. Among the unusual feelings the mind experiences is a sudden sense of being immersed in flame or in a brilliant light. This occurs entirely without worrying or outward cause and may occur at noonday or in the middle of the night. And the person at first may feel that he is becoming insane. Along with these feelings comes a sense of immortality, not merely a feeling of certainty that there is a future life, that would be a small matter, but a pronounced consciousness that the life now being lived is eternal, death being seen as a trivial incident which does not affect its continuity. Further, there is an annihilation of the sense of sin and an intellectual competency, not simply surpassing the old plane, but on an entirely new and higher plane. The cosmic conscious race will not be the race that exists today, and more than the present is the same race that existed prior to the evolution of self-consciousness. A new race is being born from us, and this new race will, in the near future, possess the earth. Emerson, in his wonderful essay on the Oversoul, clearly indicates his knowledge of the experiences mentioned herein in connection with what has been called cosmic consciousness. The following quotation, their form, will serve to disclose his general thought on the subject. And I will have to begin that in the next video.